All right, my name's Matt Bart. You're listening to episode 100B of the Looking Sideways Action Sports podcast, the show where I try and uncover the most fascinating stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Thanks for listening to this one and all downloading the show, and I hope you enjoy it. So if you've already listened to episode 100A with Danny McCaskill, I think you'll agree that one went down pretty well. And if you haven't, and you've come straight here to my episode with snowboard legend Nicholas Muller, then welcome. As you've probably gathered, I've decided to mark this significant moment in Looking Sideways history by releasing two episodes at the same time and calling them both episode 100. Now, as I mentioned in the intro to episode 100A, I wanted to do something that stoke my loyal listeners out and nod to the spirit of the podcast that's been developing over the last couple of years which meant interviewing two people who represent two different parts of our little world, Danny for episode 100A and this Nicholas Muller for episode 100B. So to Nicholas, blimey, now where do you start with Nicholas Muller? One of the most universally loved snowboarders of all time, right? He is one of the handful of riders who's undoubtedly shaped snowboarding in his own image. And I don't think there's any way you can dispute that. For over two decades, he's epitomized the style of snowboarding that sums up everything great and creative about our unique sideways art form. Even better, he just always looks like he's having a right laugh doing it. I mean, wouldn't you, if you could do a method like that or jib pad like Nicholas can? I've been lucky enough to be friends with Nicholas for a few years now. As we chat about during the podcast, we first became friends when I worked with him on fruition during the early planning stages. Mutual friend and erstwhile looking sideways guest, Brusty got me involved. So I headed to Zurich to spend a day or two interviewing Nicholas to camera. The idea was that director Martin Luxing would then use these interviews as the basis of the film structure and build the project up from there. It was a real privilege to be involved in that. And I've got to be honest, a fairly intense experience for me and Nicholas. So obviously we stayed in touch. And uh, I saw him in Lax early this year at the Sudden Rush event. He runs with Terrier and asked him if he'd be up for being a guest for episode 100. He agreed, so in early September he came over to the UK to hang out, record the episode and also take part in that pin drop event I organised a couple of months back. Proper funny couple of days hanging out in the East End with Nicholas and his girlfriend Olivia. Great to see how well he's doing. We had some funny times in some random East End boozers and uh, recorded this episode you're about to listen to. I wanted to chat to Nicholas about the whole thing really, his views on snowboarding, where he is now in his life, his inspirations, interests, generally his unique worldview on life, snowboarding and everything. So we did, and here's how it panned out. Me and Nicholas Muller. Enjoy. How you doing? Good, thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, so, well, you made it to London, so thanks for, thanks for coming over. Episode 100. Yeah, yeah, what an honor. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks no, for having me. No worries. Yeah, so how's your day? What have you been up to? Good. Uh, when we got up, it was sunny already. I think we missed the rain in the early morning. Yeah. Um, good breakfast. Nice coffee. And, yeah. Cruising. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you doing? Just going to do, obviously, we're going to do this event tomorrow night, but are you just going to do the, the tourist thing, like just hang out and just see a bit of London? Yeah, totally. Like uh, soak it all soak it all in again i've been here before but always kind of on a tighter schedule maybe like a night or two and like the film premiere kind of thing yeah exactly a promo thing and uh this time for a week so yeah i'm excited and where so where are you gonna go you're gonna travel around or yeah i think somewhere to the coast you should surf yeah Yeah. i'd love to yeah because you were saying you've never surfed in the uk right no, I haven't surfed in the UK yet. Yeah, yeah you should do it. Get down to Cornwall. Yeah. Cornwall sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And how's the summer been? So you've been you've been on the road a lot, right? Yeah. So um, in the winter, I was in Switzerland basically the whole time up until mid March. Yeah. So you just stayed then, in, in Larks like the whole time. Yeah, I guess. Oh wait, I did one trip to Utah in February. Okay. Um, for like two weeks, uh, visited Shane, stayed at his house, uh, Shane Charlebone. Yeah, yeah. Filmers of Absent. Yeah. And then uh, went to a Nixon event, back home for the Sudden Rush. Which is where I saw you, right, as well? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Sudden Rush locks. Which was great, yeah. Oh, you liked it? Yeah, it's it super cool. fun. Yeah. yeah, it's a really, really fun event. Yeah. How nice, many? thank you. How many years is that now that you've been... That was the fifth edition yeah. this, this past March, so a little anniversary. Yeah, 
yeah mm. it's it's super fun because um i mean obviously there's a lot of those events kind of happening these days but they're really nice kind of celebration of you know like everybody can get involved in that can't they you know to totally. have snowboarding yeah it's i call it more like a, a festival almost yeah. than a competition definitely right? has I mean, that vibe yeah it is a race after all and but I think you're more like competing against yourself, or at least like I do. Yeah, it really has the atmosphere, I yeah, think. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then everybody's happy, you know, everybody's smiling. And yeah. Before the race, of course, you're a little bit, um, there's a little tension. And like you said, you just want to go through every turn without making a mistake. So it's like, you know the course, and then it's just you against yourself. And yeah, yeah. Very rarely, I, I was like, going through the the finish line and i was like oh i didn't do any mistakes you know it's like oh this turn this turn there and and then after two rounds it's over you know it is what it is and yeah you, you see who's the fastest which is exciting but it almost doesn't matter right? no it doesn't really matter does yeah. it? and then the because the whole thing was fun as well like they, they did like the art show as well the like art the, show was amazing the title the thing was like show. super fun and yeah yeah so where did that i is that something that you and terry had kind of thought about for a while yeah, I mean, Terry is probably <laughs> in, was into banked slaloms before I even snowboarded. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. No, I mean, joke aside, yeah. it, it was a, um, an idea that I think all of us had involved, like Chris from Southern Rush. Yeah. And, uh, the guys at Logs, they they were ready for an, for an event that it's not necessarily an open where it has to be broadcasted, you know, all over the world and it's like tight schedule and, yeah, it's you know, a bit more uh, grassroots, right? Yeah, organizations yeah. are involved or uh, n nothing against these events, you know, but exactly grassroots. It's all about the spirit. It's all about like everybody riding the same run. Yeah. The same banks, you know. And yeah, yeah. From the little scrums to the the grand grand masters you know yeah and um that's kind of how it, it it came together and terry and me being the ambassadors for southern rush guarana yeah it was clear that oh let's do the southern rush locks yeah it's nice it. it's a nice vibe as well because obviously you guys are like they're digging out the course like beforehand and yeah you know it's a real sort of family atmosphere yeah i really enjoyed yeah. it yeah oh, thank you because you know you go to so many events don't you like on the well, like you say, they're like, you know, it's it's kind of like a gap between the people that are in the event and the people that go and watch the event. You know, like you can't, which is fine because that's that yeah. that's that type of snowboarding. Obviously, you've done like plenty of those events over yeah. the years, but it's like really nice when that barrier is kind of removed, right? And everybody's like on the same course, like hanging out, barbecue. Like it's 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 kind of a yeah, just a diff different atmosphere, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, and I thought that. For example, the the price giving shows that you know. That yeah. When you have the locks open, of course, there's people in the price giving, and they they watch the the stuff go down, and and the finals are always it's wow. This, these are the best guys, you know, the most progressive in whether it's half pipe or whatever. But at the sudden rush price giving, I've noticed I've never seen so many people. There's like everybody who competed and raced. And their friends and family, they're all there and they're all wondering what the time was. And it's just about being there. And, yeah, it's really and nice. often at these, like, yeah, the Open World Cups, half the people, they, they, they're not there for the prize giving anymore. And I mean, it's great. You want to cheer on the winner, but I was just the first Southern Rush locks we did, we were all blown away. And yeah. even like Reto Gortner, he came up and told me, hey, thank you for this event because at the rocks the this is the end of the slope where we have the the price giving it yeah. was, i've never seen so many snowboards it was, yeah the whole place was full and yeah it was super fun it made me happy it's no it's a good it's a real good vibe i met um max plots under there actually yeah yeah which is yeah so and then the, the people that show up it's like yeah wow, and we were God. you know like proper like whoa okay you know it's like real yeah. gathering of the sort of community yeah. Yeah. yeah so that was obviously kind of march right yeah, totally. And then, and then and you did then, so you did the Utah thing, and that was a, you said that was a filming trip. Yeah, and then that was a filming trip. And then by mid March, I I haven't really filmed that much yet. Uh, with absent and talked to Justin, he was going to come over, but at this time of the year, it's it can be hit or miss in Europe. You know, yeah. it can be good, but then it can get really warm. And I was like, hey, Justin, I'm going to come over. 
So we went, we went over to British Columbia, didn't really check the weather, and there was just 10 days of summer almost. Really? Just all the snow it. melted. But Utah stayed cold, and uh, we decided to road trip down to Salt Lake City again, and and there was the endless winter. It was powder till... Yeah, they had a crazy good winter, right? Yeah, it was... We left, I think, the day before my birthday, was it April 25th, and it was cold and powdery. Right. So who were you cheating with? With Justin? Yeah, Justin, um, Shane. Yeah. Uh, some of the riders. Uh, uh, Severin van der Meer, who's been on the Absent um, program now a couple of years. And yeah. Dylan Alido. Yeah, yeah. Matt Winehouse. Yeah. Is there, and a couple other guys, yeah. Yeah, and then you did you did a trip to Alaska as well, right? Was that kind yeah. of end of season? Yeah, yeah. Like Justin, always eyes up. You know, Alaska is the yeah the cherry on the cake and the end of the season. But Southeast Alaska, where we usually go to Haines, wasn't looking that good. And um, yeah, we we just didn't want to commit to something that from the experience that yeah I could be just waste of time and money but then we ended up going to Anchorage and we flew one day out of Seward and then we flew out of uh, Alaska actually so we stayed at Hotel Alaska yeah right that's a kind of crazy that, little place yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've heard lots about it but never actually made it there and it was so cool like, right it's almost like a little fairy tale play, fairy tale places yeah because it's the and, resort there right yeah, this is the resort. The resort yeah. was closed, but this hotel complex where the gondola kind of goes from, yeah, it uh, I've learned that it was some Japanese investors or something. They originally built it, and right. when I saw the place uh, first time, I, I knew this wasn't like North American style or anything. It, yeah, it sure. had this other vibe, and then when I heard it was uh, the original investors or owners were Japanese, and it totally made made sense. Right. Right. So it sounds like that winter was a little bit different from you from your previous winters, like a, a little bit mellower on the filming, if you spent so much time in lax. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, at the end, it's all about like having fun and getting in the groove. And so if it's too forced anyway, you know, yeah, it kind of it kind of shows. Have you found like, yourself being more and more drawn to kind of staying and riding at home the longer it's gone on? Yeah, also. And wherever you can get in the, the right state of mind, you know, often, you know, it doesn't take like too much. And, and like looking back at my career, some of the, the coolest shots were on days that you didn't have any expectations and just on the side of the, the road or whatever, you know, yeah. or actually like on the slope, like, yeah, yeah. who knows? You just, you just gotta, it's gonna tap into that. So what does that flow. look like? How do you, how do you kind of, is that just a question of like riding every day and then understanding when you have hit that right mindset to yeah yeah exactly and that's why some of the seasons too maybe i was like oh i'm getting stressed because the season you know it's well that's kind of what i'm getting at because it's uh the winter is uh, moving you know yeah exactly <laughs> day by day and you're like oh spring is around the corner and you're like we just got to be calm and then eventually so many places where I was like maybe like too worried about you know the shots and how you know the winter shaping up as far as like having uh, footage yeah exactly and next thing you know you thought it's like oh this it's gonna get warm and that's it and yeah. next thing you know you're on the peak and it's all time and you like just have to you know, have to be ready and you're like why did I stress like right here right now this is the moment like, yeah you've been dreaming of and all the tricks you had in mind or things just do it now you know and then you got to do it and if you stress too much then maybe that moment goes by so quick and then you're like on the way home and it's spring and summer and you're like damn like that was it yeah <laughs> and, and i wasn't and ready you know? and so you maybe like, didn't enjoy it as much as you could have done if you like let yourself enjoy that moment yeah totally yeah because that's i guess what i'm getting at when i look back at your career you know obviously when we first met and and when how long you've been riding there's that cycle isn't there you know when you especially when you're a young professional like you have to take that cycle there's like there's, there's a lot of travel there's a lot of endless trips there's a lot of chasing 
basically but it definitely seems like as your career's progressed you've still been able to maintain the same level of output and of and of, and of, and of parts and of quality of content but not but slowed it down almost if that makes sense yeah yeah totally i mean i believe in the, the saying too like less is more you know yeah sometimes so what does it mean to be a professional snowboarder is like to have like the, the most shots you know it's it's not what it is and for me too when i remember before i was a professional snowboarder the things that still stand out to me it's just like little things from some of my you know heroes at the time and for them it's, it was just that one moment and it's 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 hard to say you can't plan it you know so you just gotta you gotta ride and ride and ride of course and if if you don't enjoy that anymore then yeah maybe it's time for something else too but i've always just been the happiest you know and when i get to look sideways you know yeah ride yeah. sideways yeah. and changed a lot of things around it so i i made sure that i wouldn't lose that that joy you know so you tried to and protect it almost yeah for sure yeah so how did you how did you go about doing that by by making changes in the yeah. way that you approached it well th one of the biggest steps for sure was probably that i moved to logs actually yeah that i live at the base of a mountain yeah which was now exactly 10 years ago actually this fall and at that point i was well into in in my career right so traveling lots that wasn't a problem you know and getting to ride at the greatest you know snow wherever it was good but i just wanted to live somewhere where i didn't have to drive to get to the base in the mountain and yeah, everything. Sure. i just wanted to walk to the gondola and ride back home and and 10 years ago i was 27 28 which yeah i mean at this age maybe it's not the most normal thing when you say you're a professional snowboarder and sometimes i say that and then in the same conversation the people i meet they were like oh so that's cool that you were a professional snowboarder I'm like wait a minute i still am a still professional am, snowboarder. Yeah. you know what i mean like, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, 37 years anyway at the time when i moved to locks it it almost like kick-started another part of my career and like made me like younger again so you that know? was like, a con that was a conscious thing yeah. then, to make that decision yeah i think you and could see it i think you could see in the writing yeah think? i think so yeah because yeah, yeah. i think you could you could see like in the parts as well like it just it seemed to it was almost it was more an expression of like mm -hmm. the way that you saw it if that makes sense yeah totally you know and like i say it did, did seem to be a stillness to it almost mm -hmm. um to step away from that quite frantic approach that mm -hmm. which everybody has to do to a certain extent right like exactly. in, in the early years like you yeah. have to do that yeah but like you say it seems like there needs to be a point when you try and stop that and and look at it on your own terms maybe you know yeah yeah totally otherwise it's if you come become too complacent it's like you're going towards the center of the wheel and life almost stands still right and that was like you don't want to get annoyed having a travel part to travel and you're like oh I, I don't I hate traveling it's like right I mean you're you can do what you love the most so it's it's not anybody else's fault that you get to travel it's like you got to change it for yourself and then yeah I mean it's part of growing up too and when I was in my early 20s and everything was fresh and I, I enjoyed being that guy and like look at me it's so cool and then it changed you know and I realized that yeah some people still are like fans of me but okay what am I doing here I'm promoting snowboarding so like okay let's I you know it sounds like oh of course right but you have to like realize these things too and it it yeah it, it just jumpstart another level of joy somehow and 
Did it, yeah. did it coincide with also, obviously, because you're other interest in something that you've talked a lot about is, you know, the environment and issues of sustainability and conservation. Did it coincide with that? Did, did, was it a good point for you to change that, to try and slow that side of things down? Like the travel and the kind of... Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and getting more involved with uh, the product and stuff and just learning, you know, and then because snowboarding is the, the great thing about also surfing and skating is once you drop in you just you don't think anymore you just it's almost like a meditation right you're like thinking slows down because you have to react immediately to what's in front of you so it's a very real it's a relaxation well so, meditative then, is a good way of putting it right yeah yeah it is and then after riding or even before then i'd like oh wow like i want to like learn more and what's behind the scenes and where stuff come from etc etc and then yeah maybe we'll enough we talk later about that but then almost yeah you come to a point too where you're like oh i wish i actually don't know that you know yeah right it's like ignorance is bliss it's the more you know that's it's just like so complex i mean um i, I want to talk about maybe the event tomorrow about water like and I somehow on the internet came across this guy, Victor Schauberger, that actually uh, discovered like free energy within water. And it has to do with it, you know, go winding around rocks and stuff. And he, he to prevent a, a creek to go flow overboard, he actually doesn't plant the rocks on the side. He plants them in the middle, so they have to meander. And that ca causes the energy that kind of prevents it from going you know outside and he victor schauberger very um interesting guy i, I recommend to yeah, do some I, research I, I had a look into it after okay. we were, after we were talking and yeah seemed like a very visionary character who was kind of yeah. sidelined a little bit from his uh, innovations let's say yeah totally and and he i guess he, he lived in the 18 something and into the early 1900s and and then there was the world wars. I guess you know the stuff got lost. You know, it's not like now it's in the internet, but there's still. If you if you look at YouTube, the, some of the videos about him and his technology, and I think his grandson is the one that's you know still kind of talking about these things, and they have like thirty thousand views maximum. You know, and how many people are you? And and I've learned that he did the first patent of a jet turbine, and the same thing. It has to do with the spiral uh, thing, and the the jet planes actually they're not shooting through the air like most people think. They actually get sucked through the air. So once this turbine get going, like it's not shooting, it's sucking because it taps into this implosion. So it's actually energetically and for how many people that travel it's not that bad and the whole world just points at like cl climate change and flying is the number one cause which is not and, and, and even these organizations you know they talk about climate change and offset your, your your carbon footprint from flying you know it's just like Ah, that, that's what I meant with like the more you know the, it's like you know I, I was the one rooting like climate change politicians and flying and like and then you look into how a jet turbine actually works it's it's unreal you know well I, I, I chatted to Jeremy Jones about this when mm -hmm. I interviewed him and he he made a similar point about you know I guess this conversation about like individual action and, and the changes that you actually need to make to affect change and he kind of made a similar point which is like yeah you can you can make individual change you know you can stop flying you can you can do that but really the reality is if you want to stop this and there needs to be wholesale industrial change you know which is gonna yeah. which is what it would really take to make change yeah. but what's interesting about um what you're talking about with him as well is i mean he was a visionary because he's talking about using natural energy right you mm -hmm. know resources like water and air as a way of yeah. like generating energy which is mm -hmm. suddenly obviously quite visionary because you know yeah. that is what's going to need to happen right yeah totally and he discovered that as a, a a forester you know and the academics then were laughing at him that they were you know years and years in the universities and he came with his theses and they just laughed at him you know 
but he, he he proved so many things and i don't know where these patents are now they're probably some oil company and the same thing i, I wouldn't put my hand in the fire but i through the internet as a research there was a a convention in geneva in 1892 where all the countries sent delegates to to define over what is organic matter and whatnot and the rockefeller sent a delegate to define that oil was fossil based which is not it's an abiotic liquid it's the second largest liquid on earth after water and this, this is like over 100 years later and and you have organizations they say stop fossil fuel blah 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 it's like god like do your research but it's almost too long and and that's why rockefeller probably is one of the richest families nowadays you know yeah well they uh basically marketed that extremely well yeah so gotta be careful what we're talking about here <laughs> well uh, like you say tomorrow night yeah, yeah. <laughs> so did you but did you personally make a lot of changes with um with your lifestyle because did you did you ever feel like there was a contradiction between having these sort of views and and the amount of travel that you like necessarily yeah. have to do like yeah. how do you how do you kind of reconcile that well like i said the, the victor schauberger and and you can do research with the youtube videos and there's uh, explains exactly how a jet turbine works and um one of his apprentices is still alive i think he's now I don't know, 70 years old. And uh, in that YouTube video, this German uh, student goes and films this ap apprentice of, of Schauberger, this old man in his home. He has all these prototypes. And he's like, oh, this was the prototype of the first uh, turbine. Uh, or this, they had this like pot that was shaped like a sort of a triangle. It has to do with the shape as well. And he's like, with this, I heat my whole house with 34 volts or something, you know, and he explained the first prototype of jet turbine only used, like, so little volts, and when it got to working speed, it, it shattered his shack because it <laughs> went through the roof because <laughs> it tapped into implosion, but it only was 17 volts, so that opened my mind to the dimensions, you know what I mean? So when I actually saw that, I was like, I knew there was something. I knew, like, of course flying uses, uh, you know, um, offsets, you know, carbon, which back to before, like when oil, oil is not fossil fuel, it's abiotic, it's still, you know, there's something that's coming out when, when we burn it. So we still have to look at that. But um, when I realized, like, I knew it was flying wasn't that bad. And I don't fly that much, but I fly a bunch of times a year, you know. And I just thought it was weird that the whole world would just point at that. And, and, is like my dad who, who became wanted to become a politician and he went with the Green Party. And this was years ago and he came back and he's like, this is bullshit. We, I went there with the Green Party and they all had a steak on their plate, you know? And that should be the Green Party. Yeah. You know, and they're saying, stop flying, stop driving. And it's like, it's a joke. So for me, I've, I think that the biggest um, change you can make is with the way you spend your money on food and... Amazon is burning more than ever so they can grow soy. And it's just, let's be realistic, you know, 80% of that soy goes into cattle farming and the other 20%, yeah, it's the, the people that, okay, stop eating meat and then you eat the tofu, you know, so it's, they eat the same soy, but it didn't go through an animal at least. But like, if everybody would really just boycott meat, today for just one year i think all of these companies will go bankrupt and then that will make a change a change but everybody would have to be on board and yeah i mean it's it's difficult for people isn't it i think the thing like when you talk about the flying for example mm. you know that is something that people can kind of easily like if you look at like something like offsetting or like um yeah. plastic recycling or like whatever it is like these these kind of gestures if you like it's it, i guess it's a way of people feeling like they can make a difference and kind of solving that that guilt almost and, yeah, exactly. and making yeah. themselves feel a little bit better but like you mm -hmm. say to actually you know you, you're probably right like actually the something like everybody switching to a, a plant-based diet is yeah. going to have an impact right yeah but you know it's obviously 
a huge challenge to try and get people to change their behavior on that level, isn't it really? Yeah, it is. I mean, somebody hungry, you go down the street and it's all alone going to the, you know, get a kebab, but like, oh, there's a sandwich, yeah, come and let's eat the sandwich. You know, it's like you don't little really packet, see little, it there. Get you a know? little packet of meat. Yeah, yeah, and then, you know, people have been talking about it like me now, but it's you have to see the the connections you know and that's the first step and it's it's a long it's a long process but I, it's just you know i just wanna <laughs> i gotta say it and so do you do you think um it's basically a personal choice thing for you then to try and like change these lifestyle things that you believe in and try and keep yeah the kind of travel lifestyle that you've got and yeah i mean th- like let's say 10 years ago when i was more interested, okay, how are things working, the, the connections, why things are bad, like sustainability, blah, blah. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna travel anymore, you know? But then it's like, oh, if I go to Japan and for a promo thing and show my snowboard video and then say that I'm a vegetarian, you know, maybe it inspires 10 out of 100 people. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep doing that, you know? It's, I've realized thing and now I'm going to hide out in the forest <laughs> and that plane seat is filled with another CEO from a Swiss bank that goes there and it's like the root of all evil like no I'm not going to do that so I'm going to yeah. keep doing it but the, the hard work is let's say somebody actually okay I'm going to consciously not eat meat anymore let's say I don't, I don't need to say a part of the world and then that's it's a long road to like to educate yourself and because you can't just eat leave the meat away nowadays because you have a bunch of overcooked vegetables that probably never grown on soil and your french fries you're gonna get sick really quick so they're like oh vegetarians not healthy to go back to meat or then the, the option is like tofu and all your soy or wheat protein yeah it's another thing like i can't eat wheat anymore i just can't do it i'd rather eat nothing it's it's like soy, it's a very bad monoculture, so you have to treat it heavily with pesticides and co, and you have to uh, use artificial fertilizer, same with wheat. So apart from it being a crop like wheat that actually doesn't have that many nutritional ingredients, it's full of those poisons yeah. that you eat. So the, a person stops eating meat, but then they eat soya, uh, tofu every day, and then they get sick too. And then they think, oh, that's bullshit. I got to go back to eating meat. And it's like, no, it was like such a good approach. But then the way everything's set up and ah, it's just so much manipulation out there, you know. But this actually, I don't know if now is the time for it, but we can talk about hemp. Well, I was going to ask you because to, to contextualize it, because we were mm-hmm. talking about this earlier. So you you do have a couple of um, projects that you're working on, right? So yeah. maybe ex- before you, it'd be good to explain that. So you've got this company that you that you founded, right? Yeah. And you and you're basically working with hemp, right? So yeah, maybe explain a little bit about that. Yeah, totally. So we are um, we're called Alpen Pioneer. We founded about three years ago, and since one and a half years, we have um, products on the market. So we make hemp food. Yeah, that just tried some hemp yeah. on, my, yeah. on my poke bowl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hemp from Switzerland, grown in the Swiss valleys, certified organic with uh, organic farmers. Because again, hemp is a, a plant that works as a monoculture, meaning you don't have to treat it with pesticides or use artificial fertilizer. Yeah. Opposed to soya and wheat and the modern wheat and co. Uh, which is, for one, okay, there is very good. You don't eat these toxins, you don't pollute the groundwater, and actually hemp puts, there's n- no other plant that so efficiently puts carbon into the ground. And every farmer know, knows this, a carbon-rich ground is a good ground, uh, soil. So the farmers love it. They have hemp in their rotation. So it means the, the next year where they had hemp, they grow vegetables and they come very good. That's one fact. Just for that, we were like, let's do this. Hemp needs to grow again. Another fact, soya again. Switzerland, I've learned, imports every year uh, more than 300,000 tons of soya for cattle and humans. This needs to stop. Where does this come from? You know, you don't see this when you go in a Swiss supermarket. Here's like, oh, everything's 
good. What are these people talking about? The world is turning to shit, you know? But yeah, I mean, we don't see this. We don't live in the Amazon. You yeah, know? you don't see the damage. And so for that fact, we're like, okay, hemp needs to grow again. And it has, it is, soya import is because of protein for animals and humans. Hemp is the best protein for humans and animals as well. So there's no need actually, you know. On top of that, it has multiple unsaturated fatty acids in an ideal combination as omega-369, as minerals, vitamins, etc. And I was like, wow, when I've learned that, let's do this. So yeah, we started Alpen Pioneer and it's been very fun. And so sometimes we get the questions, oh, can I smoke it? Or like, <laughs> oh, does it have THC? Or like some people like, no, get- I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm like, okay, this person obviously is so... Uh, manipulated you're gonna get the, a lot the of those demonization questions. you know that yeah yeah well that's the it. place fair enough we just but actually very little what we're talking and about it's like education isn't it it's like what people are used to you know you use the word manipulation yeah. but basically people are used to like you know if you talk about what you're talking about like how people are used to getting their protein delivered in a certain way they used to getting their food delivered in a certain mm-hmm. way and you know something like this is quite apart from that status quo so people do find it unusual right you know they yeah, do they yeah, do totally. and they associate it with like you say like oh right hemp okay weed you know like mm-hmm. whatever like yeah. there's there's a big education sort of angle to this right isn't there to kind of enable yeah. people to accept it really which is again yeah. almost a huge part of the challenge that's faced isn't isn't there to totally. to change exactly this. that's what i meant before right yeah when they, okay i'm gonna stop consciously eating meat and then wow okay this and then it starts you know you yeah just, exactly you can't just eat the tofu like yeah so how's the response been like is the people really good actually yeah. yeah and you can tell and the first like a year ago i was walking around everywhere uh, with we one of our products, it's we call it Kinoanf, which means movie hemp. It's just the roasted hemp nuts. So the seed is considered a nut. Roasted salted hemp nuts and just handing out everywhere in, in the streets and friends. And they're like, even the skeptic, they're like, okay, let me try. And they're like, mm, this is actually really good. <laughs> and when I don't have hemp in a while now, I, I really feel like I'm actually lacking something. It just feels so like... Uh, nourishing and almost grounding and I think it's our body when we like for example chew the hemp nuts and there's so many ways you can, you can implement it in your food it doesn't mean that you have to chew the nuts all the time right but yeah. like even when you chew the nuts in uh, on your tongue which is a big part of your uh, digestion it's almost like the body like it's like knows that oh, it's like oh, finally something good like eating something that we are actually made of and this brings me to an, another thing I, I've realized through, yeah, um, I've learned, you know, along the way from from uh, internet, whatever source, that um, this guy explained it very well, that no animal, no plant actually consumes something that's not made of. It's only the human that comes up with, like, zombie food as he called yeah, it yeah like, like compounds. artificial things yeah, yeah, or like yeah. you know gummy bears and all this shit and especially when you go to the kids aisles in the supermarket and you're like oh my god this is all zombie foods yeah. this is not what our body is made of like you know like an animal would eat gummy bears it would be dead in a week you know <laughs> it's, uh, it's like it, it, yeah right if you really think about it it's crazy and, uh, and hemp was part of our evolution and that's probably why on the paper okay Protein means amino acids. Hemp has all 20 amino acids. So why wouldn't we as a human eat the best protein? We all need protein, you know? Protein is like the brick to a house. It's the, the, it's the, the element to our body. It's like the brick for our body. The way we renew ourselves constantly, you know? It's not just the bodybuilder who needs a lot of protein. Yeah, sure, yeah. And well, even people in the old age, you know? There's a thing called uh, muscle loss in age. And they say the only thing to counterbalance that is to take more protein. And do more exercise and keep more Yeah, do more exercise. But a lot of uh, elderly people actually have chronic inflammation from too much animal amino acids, animal protein. And that's why they're losing the muscles too. So the counteraction will be more protein, but you can't take more protein because it's, it's... it's why you are chronically inflamed. Yeah, so yeah. Therefore, hemp is the solution. It's for everybody, from a baby to to an elderly person. 
have you have you found that because obviously one of the things you're talking about here as well is like you've obviously got a really strong awareness of of how nutrition and what you put in your body affects you personally yeah is that is that something that you've always recognized or is that developed as you've got older oh definitely developed i mean when i was a a teenager and i was really into you know i was always active always outside and i wanted to be a a pro footballer and and then a pro snowboarder yeah because you were like super sporty kid right like football when you were young skating when you were young i mean you know always outside my mom had to like come in to eat and it's like yeah i'm like I mean, you know, I'm like skinny guy still, and um, and my mom at the time always said, "Oh, you want to be a pro snowboarder, so you gotta like be aware of what you eat." And she, and I was like, "I want canned ravioli, like <laughs> my friends at school, you know." And she's yeah. like, "No, you eat this." And, and then so I, I had a little bit growing up, you know, my mom became more conscious uh, at the time. But then you're still young. You don't really feel the effects, you know. When you're young, you can eat shit for days and you're fine. And yeah, you don't really think about yeah, it. And maybe it doesn't get, really matter. You get some more pimples or whatever, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. And then it, it maybe catches up. But at the time, maybe if you're lucky, you realize that this actually has to do with what you eat. You know, ideally, if not, then you're like, oh, go to the doctor, and they say like, oh, just take this, and you don't even talk about why. Sure. Maybe it's like that. So. I've I've realized that luckily because you know the, the way I come up and then traveling I started to seek organic stores and then I've, I've learned at the organic stores and it's it's fun for example I go to my local organic stores you know it's you talk with the people maybe you know if you have time oh what's this and they explain it to you and if you go to the supermarket it's like beep 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 they don't even have time to like hey what, what should they do I have this and that you know so I learned a lot along the way. But one thing that really opened my eye to is when I f- realized that I was like becoming allergic to wheat. Right. And I mean, it sounds a little bit weird for me to say allergic because it's just my body, it was the barrel was full. I couldn't, whenever I had wheat, in my late twenties, my nose would immediately plug up. It was just turn into mucus because I was traveling since I was seventeen for snowboarding and yeah, sure. and, and being a vegetarian often you eat a cheese sandwich. Yeah. And so I've had too much cow dairy and too much wheat and my body's just like no more. And that's why when I have wheat, there's wheat somewhere I immediately know because You can tell. I can tell. Yeah. But then, you know, you have to like realize okay why is it like that you know mm. because the wheat now it's not the wheat that our grandparents had like the wheat back in the days it was called emmer or spelt you know that was the original forms and now they're like modified and they go well with all the the, the artificial um fertilizer and the pesticides and in america there's for example a huge gluten-free trend yeah, gluten-free 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 but I think most of the people there are actually not. I mean, there is so much gluten now compared yeah. to even for 10 years because yeah. that's actually what they get paid for, the amount of gluten, because that's the, that makes the bread stick together. But I think most of these people are actually allergic to the, the pesticides on that because, yeah, like I said, very bad monocultures. Yeah. So it's a mixture of that, you know? Yeah. So you start and being too much in the food chain because... In Switzerland, you go to a supermarket, you have a whole row of bread. Yeah. There's maybe one loaf in 150 that is not made from the the same grain. That yeah. is the w- wheat number E, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you have to search and, for and, it. And, the, and I mean, don't blame the people. Like, even today, I was like, do you have, um, what kind of bread do you have? Do you only have wheat bread? And they, <laughs> they're like, uh, we have sourdough, you know? Yeah. I was like, and don't blame this person because like, but sourdough has nothing to do with what the grain actually is. Yeah. You can we've have got, we've got we've got bread, bread. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. And yeah. then like, ugh, we've got bread, nobody mate. cares about what the grain is of. So you have a whole row of bread. Everything's the same grain. Then you have all your cookies and, and cakes and all is wheat too, with yeah. sugar and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Then you have your pizza, your pasta. It's all the same grain. And that's, it's no, there's no balance in the food chains. And that's why people, of course, become 
allergic you know yeah so you started to notice how it was affecting you and, and gradually started to kind of change the way that you you, you well what you put in your body basically yeah, yeah, yeah totally how did it affect your snowboarding did it did it change the way that you could ride or did yeah. you see it did you see an impact in that yeah um I think like the root of all illness and injury is your body's pH level being too acidic. So for me, of course, that's why my nose immediately plucked up because too acidic, you know. And mucus is a, is another thing, you know, mucus food. That's what Doctor Sebi, if you Google him, you can learn a lot about what actually is mucus food. And but um, yeah, I think then from like, okay, now I only eat spelt bread, which is a more ancient form of wheat and I could eat all day long my nose wasn't blocked up you know I was like oh okay so I realized things now when I go snowboarding and I have two coffees you know and you're in the mountains all day you don't drink enough water I feel like I become acidic my body can handle it so much but then after a week of doing that I was like ah landed flat on my knees like ah oh, that's a little sharp pain you know yeah it's the little things from being too acidic where your whole House of Cards can crumble, you know? Yeah, I think everyone so, can recognize that. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, perhaps maybe not in those terms, but definitely, you know, you have a kind of best version of yourself, don't you? You know, when you're yeah. eating healthily and you, you get enough sleep and you're exactly. kind of, and, and, you, and you know that you feel right and then maybe you go on the road and you drink too many beers, like you say, you drink too many yeah, coffee, yeah. you don't get enough sleep and yeah, you start to feel it. You start to feel it, those niggles come back. Yeah. You know, you start... Those little tweaks, you start to feel them again, right? Yeah, totally. Mm. So all I can say now is I'm 37 and I'm still shredding. I'm, I'm trying to send it, you know. I even learned new tricks last winter. And, oh, yeah, uh, what was that? That's a good question. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> wait, I, I have to watch uh, my video part. But no, I feel like I did some stuff I never did. And I don't know why. And it, it worked. Uh, I don't remember getting hurt the last time, except for last year when I landed too flat and hit my nose and then got a nose uh, an ear infection. But you can't do anything about that. That's not. Yeah, that's a different thing. That's a stupid. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, but not like oh, I, sh I should have. But as you get older, you're feeling like you can you can have more control by the sounds of it on on these yeah. outcomes by the way that you yeah yeah, yeah I which mean, is which is important when mm -hmm. you start to get in your late thirties and early forties and you want to keep doing these things mm -hmm. right you have to you have to approach it differently for sure yeah yeah and that's so that it's interesting to hear you say that that you kind of really you know noticing that relationship so explicitly with this yeah so yeah. has it helped you enjoy it more. Do you think has your relationship with because you know one thing that you said earlier and we've talked about this before when we've chatted for previous interviews you know obviously from super young age you know you've been skateboarding snowboarding surfing all in whole life dedicated to a you know has your relationship to that changed as well as you've got older the enjoyment that you get out of it not that much really I think it what's what did change of course is w w what's like specifically you know I got it, a joy of I mean I still like I said um, I try something I never did and even though it's not the craziest trick and it worked I was like oh that's a good feeling you yeah know? and especially when you get it on camera you know it's like it's cool but no at the end of the day it's it really hasn't change that much and it's the same it, I, I was never very good to put this in words but it's that feeling I was going to say you're looking you're for, for that like, feeling <sighs> yeah of yes. uh, is it does it relate it, to that kind of meditative thing that you're talking about as well because mm -hmm. you know you, you were almost describing like what's enjoyable about it is the lack of thinking yeah. other than what's immediately in front of you so if you you know if you're free riding or like mm -hmm you're just faced with those immediate or even when you're surfing mm -hmm. right you know you're faced with those immediate decisions aren't you mm -hmm. it's very instant and it's also yeah. almost muscle muscle memory and kind of subconscious a lot of the time isn't it you know yeah. you just you just make those decisions you don't really know why yeah exactly yeah, that, yeah. that's happened yeah and that's where the kind of meditative quality and the enjoyment comes from right mm -hmm. that yeah. feeling that you're talking about totally yeah and with snowboarding especially after riding a full day in locks or something I feel very grounded and it probably actually physically has to do because you're like you're like stomping and you're like yeah you're constantly pressing and then at the end of the day you step out of the the, 
the board and you're like, oh, I feel grounded. And, I, you know, little things I, I've noticed and it shouldn't be like that, but when I don't shred sideways for a while, it's just sometimes little things from the day to day, I get so annoyed and I was like, when I have that writing, it just doesn't even bother me, you know? It's yeah. Kind of thing. And you, and you still skating and surfing as much as you always did? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, not as much. I could surf more for sure and, and skate as well. Um, I, 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 I love it. Skateboarding is, is so cool. Like, we really just need your your board and your, your sneakers and flat ground and yeah do some no complies and it's such a good feeling definitely gets harder yeah. on the body though right it it does yeah but I, I wouldn't like to throw myself down rails or flip tricks downstairs anymore I mean yeah just cruise I mean, it I'd like to ideally but and it's impressive to watch but just cruising and just doing turns on a skateboard and just like adjusting your body posture and that back leg and just leaning into a turn it's it's all it takes really yeah so when you were describing earlier you said that you were talking to your mom and she was like oh you want to be a professional snowboarder so it was sounds like that was an ambition pretty early then yeah probably like around 13 or something yeah it's pretty 13 um, 14 where did that ambition come from did you just think it was possible or was it just like this is what i want to do Mm mm-hmm yeah, I've I've learned through Monster Backside magazine probably as uh, growing up in the German speaking part of Switzerland. I I got a subscription. I think maybe even for my mom. I don't know how she. I, I probably like bought a Mac. Yeah, like, get, get got me a, this. Yeah, I got yeah, a subscription, yeah. and yeah. then which was let me think. Yeah, twelve, thirteen. So that was like ninety four, ninety five, and then like I went to the local store and. There was a VHS Subject Hawkinson and I bought it because I probably saw in the magazine they were like talking highly about Terrier and, and then I got this VHS and for a while I was like coming home from school and my mom like she all, well, she knew like I wanted to watch Subject Hawkinson and she, she put down the blinds it was like sunny but I wanted to be like watch that film like over and over. Yeah. And uh, yeah. It it was my dream, and like him and others, obviously showed at the time that it was possible. You know, and yeah, definitely a long long shot, but um, also not that crazy because I grew up in Switzerland. And yeah, and there's the a mountains great, were an hour away. Yeah, and there's so, a great scene yeah. around you right at that yeah. time. So yeah, did you probably. meet like Brusty and guys like that at, around this time? No, Brusty, I didn't meet until later when I was already um, sponsored. Maybe like a couple years later, maybe like, yeah, not too much later, maybe like 15, 16, he got hired to shoot the Palmer team, <laughs> which was obviously Sean Palmer, his board brand. Yeah. But I think the main investors and the producers were out of Switzerland. And that's why there was some Swiss guys on the team. and and But not so much freestyle. It was Patrick and Sabine were hustler. They were riding for Palmer and they were always in locks and they kind of noticed me and they gave me some tips like narrow your stance I was like zero zero super wide stance yeah, like yeah. whole hybrid style knee, it's knee, like knees by your ears yeah like, exactly yeah. like cut off the nose and tail kind of yeah, style that era yeah. and they're like pipe narrow your stance and then give me tips and then you're like hey do you want to ride for Palmer I was like oh my god so I got on Palmer oh is that your first sponsor then? yeah oh, yep, I didn't yep. realise that yep. for some reason I always thought Burton was your first one my first proper contract. Yeah, for but sure. the first boards yeah. you got flowed with Palmer. Yeah, flowed with oh, Palmer. Been, and they must have been stoked. Yeah, I was super stoked. And especially Patrick and Sabine, I'm super grateful and super full circle because their son, Jonas, now is like my age at the time where I uh, really started. No way, right. I think maybe he's a little bit younger, but no, I think he's like that. So you can kind of and return the favor. They have an apartment now in Locks again and I see him on the mountain so much. Oh, man, but he's stoked. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah and they helped me so much in the beginning and Patrick showed me how to make twist and all that stuff and yeah then, and then Brusty was hired to shoot the team and that's how I met him in locks on the glacier in the half pipe and okay right first photos and then 
I got on Burton and then got to go on a on a shoot for Absinthe. Yeah. Which at the time he didn't have Absinthe. He was uh, he was a photographer. Yeah, for, he was for a Monster Backside and too. and the onboard stuff as well, right? Yeah, I think first MBM, but for that was at the time. Yeah. At my first checkout, first article ever in the Snowbird magazine was MBM checkout. Yeah. The, polymer shop from Lox. Yeah, yeah. And then I think he went to onboard. And then I got him Burton and yeah, it's everything went yeah. like crazy. Cuz cuz the app, how old would, would you've been on that first absinthe part like 18? Yeah, I I turned 18 actually on that trip. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um cuz you know, like when you look back it's, it's a classic period, right? You yeah. Know? Especially yeah. for you guys like a, you know, the right kind of people coming together at the right time and Yeah. Also, that era of snowboarding where the you know still the parts were so important in that old style way, you know. Like, yeah. Did you kind of recognize it as that opportunity when it was happening? Did you kind of think like, yeah, fuck, I've got to, kind of got to make this? Yeah. Well, I was a rookie then, you know, still, and there was like Mickey Alvin, Sapa, you know, Steve Gruber. It was like so. Absinthe was like the U- Europe and answer to like standard and Mac yeah Dog and, and, and Mac Dog, yeah yeah and so i was like the super rookie on there but like i i, I got shots you know so it's like cool but now looking back yeah it's it's extremely sp- special time right i mean also for the super pros at the time but especially for, me, for like european snowboarding yeah definitely because totally. it's almost like the first time that it was on a par with america wasn't it yeah, with, yeah, like with, global with, recognition with the of. quality of production as well. Yeah. I'm not talking about like obviously you, you had people like Terry and Ingemar and, mm-hmm. and Daniel yeah. Frank and all those guys yeah. before that, but more of projects that, like you say, was on its own terms that you didn't need to go to California, you didn't need to go to the states yeah. to film, and yeah, it's yeah, definitely totally, yeah, definitely yeah. like an interesting period, right? Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, 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 but like like putting spots on the map it's not just whistler and tall yeah and stuff. exactly it's like, oh my god where's that oh that's in steve gruber's backyard you know, and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah and, uh, yeah yeah right so yeah so good times when you look back yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah and then so you were then on burton sort of for quite a while right like yeah 13 years i think yeah so um, yeah so most of and most of your 20s and yeah from 2000 to or 99 till 2000 and maybe more than 13 years actually till 14 and the 14 yeah because you, you used to ride i think i remember seeing you like win the pipe in the european open right you used to you yeah. used to do like pipe comps yeah. and again it's like back in that era when you did everything and mm-hmm. people would do the pipe comps to do the big airs do the film parts and yeah but you gradually started to kind of close that part of it off maybe a little bit yeah i just didn't have time to really write halfpipe yeah. anymore and alox always had an amazing halfpipe but good place there, to be yeah there was a while where um i had an apartment before i was sponsored and kind of sort of started to get sponsors with some like a community and then i gave that up and then i traveled the world and then not until i've always had the season card but i wasn't that much around so it's just chasing the dream around the world and riding yeah. mainly powder and more jump contests so i wasn't actually looking back 2015 was my last half pipe contest at the burton european open i got third place and i still have no idea how because <laughs> at, in 2015 i barely from 03 02 i yeah, I never a, really rode pipe except a lo- for a contest so a i was like gap. how is that possible because yeah yeah the guys were that's their thing right so like Keir Dillon and Andy Finch and they were just riding pipe pipe and I just show up and I got third place but that was like kind of the last time and then after I was like if I want to have a shot in this I really need to train yeah pipe so yeah it's a good point to kind of move away from that yeah yeah, yeah. so is the decision to leave Burton like a what what because that was quite a shock at the time, I think, for people. Because it was, yeah. Because you were very associated with with those guys, yeah. weren't you? Yeah, totally. Especially with people like Terry, because obviously you got such a good relationship with Terry, and he's been yeah. there forever. You yeah, know. totally. It was almost like everybody expected you to follow that path a little yeah. bit. Yeah, totally. Um, and other people too, you know, at Burton, and it's a it's a big company, uh, the biggest snowboard company, probably, and. Um, 
it 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 wasn't easy and but i remember like at some point the team manager told me and this is way before look there's only going to be one terry <laughs> you know he told me it's like okay i get this so it's like and which is weird though because i always think and not to interrupt you but i always yeah. think um snowboarding is pretty bad at that right you know because there should be room for more than one terrier yeah. really yeah. you look at surfing okay. like mm. all those guys yeah, have a status yeah. you know yeah it would be Oki, yeah. like jerry lopez like whoever it is like all those people have you yeah. know they don't get they don't get elbowed out yeah exactly it was it was be like not to compare me with anybody but like let's say like john john coming up somebody telling me like hey you know there will be only be one kelly slater yeah and exactly then, and he'd be like oh god and yeah no exactly now, look it's, at him john right john it, it's, it, i so, always thought snowboarding was like the industry was like pretty short-sighted with that i never understood it because mm. it seemed like guys got to not even old either i mean i remember talking to mickey albin about mm. getting dropped by burton and mm. he was like oh they told me i was too old and i was like how old were you and he was like i was 24 <laughs> yeah exactly that's <laughs> like wow okay that's pretty crazy yeah um yeah. but like it just seemed weird that you wouldn't try and harness that yeah. a little bit you know yeah no i think um you know no no bad feelings uh, anybody but at the time i got the offer from nike and um it was just wow at, at first i was like i was oh i'm gonna be loyal to burton for sure but then you know it for whatever reason they they couldn't match you know the offer and i was like oh what should i do and then i thought about like michael jordan and roger fader and i was like why not this is my life like yeah yeah and then it was really hard but that's like i'm going for it you know well, it was kind of at the time nike and weren't as accepted were they you know yeah, in, not, in our world so yeah not yet and there was a time they were and then they you know they pulled the plug and um so that was a, a huge thorn in, in the eyes of you know some guys that that had uh, the decision makers at Burton and I, I understand you know it's you advertise somebody that's not really and you know it used to be that you're on Burton head to toe or, or nothing but then um, you know a lot of people had my back at Burton too so I had a hard goods contract but like I just said it was it was hard you know and yeah I understand and then it was like I always only had like one year contracts and, and then I was trying to, to make my film eventually you know which yeah. is fruition now yeah, yeah. and it's just at the time it was a two-year project and i get a one-year contract it's just i don't know it's just weird and then you have a one-year contract this means that okay let's talk again in six months you know because you're not gonna talk when it's up so it's like really like yeah it's regular yeah every time and then i was like who do I, okay who do i want to write for and and it's, there's only really GNU and I got so excited I was like yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna write for the 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 realist or the unrealist board brand out there and yeah it, it's um, it's such a good match I'm, I'm so happy like I'm part of the GNU family it, it, it feels really good and yeah it made a lot of sense I think because mm, because yeah. they've always been the kind of counter story in a way like yeah. got the roots but yeah. gone the Again, we used the word grassroots earlier, but kind of kept that yeah, feeling about what they do. Yeah, you know. So obviously, with the guys that have ridden for them over the years as well, and totally, yeah. you know, the Pacific Northwest kind of yeah. vibe to it all. Totally, yeah, yeah definitely made sense. Mm -hmm. And how did it end up with Nike then? Because also that was they kind of pulled yeah. they pulled it right. They just yeah, pulled everything. It, yeah, it was, it was a shame. This product was so good. The people worked for nike snowboarding they were they're awesome you know there's awesome people everything seemed to be right but then i guess yeah i don't know what happened to the world just the economy of snowboarding was less and then for a big corporation like that they just decided to pull the plug because it wouldn't it wouldn't calculate for them you know with the numbers so yeah Big it, decision. It is what it is. A, a really big decision. Big snap decision as well. It was just like yeah. that, wasn't it? Like next day, kind of like, oh, okay, right, Nike's out. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. Weaver's a good friend of mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's these people that I was yeah. talking about. And yeah. I remember speaking to him and being a bit like, wow, okay, that's <laughs> that's pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I guess that's what they do, isn't it? I mean, I remember when Salomon started a surf program in maybe like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. You remember that? Yeah. 
I did like two years R and D sponsored that's right loads of surfers yeah and then just one day we're like no we're not going to do that anymore just yeah. pulled it all yeah. yeah yeah guess that's those margins right for those companies yeah yeah, yeah. it's the bigger you get the more complicated uh, i think i don't know yeah so yeah fruition you mentioned as well which obviously mm-hmm. we did a little bit of work on together yeah um how do you how do you feel about that looking back because that was a that was a lot of hard work for you right yeah it's a lot of hard work and I'm really happy with the film. Um, for sure, in hindsight, I would maybe change a, a couple things, you know. But um, no, I'm stoked. Yeah, I'm stoked we did it. Thank you for being part of it. Nice. Oh, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's good. Well, it's yeah. interesting watching the way you guys are approaching it because when Martin asked me to to get involved and explained so the idea was that we'd basically we think we do we do two days of interviews one day two days a, a very full on lot of sessions of interviews basically yeah about yeah. your life and career and then it was yeah. all filmed and then from that that was where the kind of idea for the subjects came from right totally yeah yeah he, so to build up in that way which for a snowboarding film is pretty unusual yeah, yeah. definitely for sure yeah yeah so, yeah exactly we I think two days or yeah. like a full day of I'm interview a, and Martin just sat there for just listened to the whole thing up and down and then made notes and then from that actually like puzzled uh, uh, together. Like a concept. You know, a concept, totally. Yeah. yeah. And I remember when you were putting that together as well, like funding it was, was kind of difficult at points. It was because it was at the time where, yeah, things were going down, the numbers in snowboarding and... Shortly after, it's like the same thing when Nike pulled the plug. So it wasn't the most, the best times financially for, for snowboarding. And for me, it was clear I didn't want to make a film that had my whole career in it, you know? Yeah, to do and that thing. represent it, uh, no offense to anybody, but to be Red Bull represents or Monster presents, which at the time and now, probably even more than ever, it's the only... There's a lot of those projects around. The only budgets, you know, they're out yeah. there for something bigger. Yeah, definitely. So, and at the time where I got a little budget from all my sponsors, I didn't really have the concept. I just knew I was ready for something else, you know. After yeah. 30 video parts was just, you know, snow porn projects kind of thing. Yeah. So that was a part of the appeal to and try and do something a little yeah, bit with a different approach. Yeah, so time past when that and then that little money i had was you know spent on some trips that then i had footage but barely could use it because then i had a new board sponsor so yeah came halfway through and right? then everybody's like hey how's it going to your film i'm like uh it's going <laughs> yeah <laughs> shit <laughs> what am i gonna do and that's when i basically took my whole nike salary that year and invested it in the film yeah yeah Back to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So have you got another one in you? Do you think? Yeah. Another project like that? Yeah, I've been thinking about it lately. And um, I mean, there's so many ways to make a beautiful film with just about snowboarding or whatever. But it's just lately with all the stuff that I think is so such bullshit, the manipulation, like some stuff we were talking about earlier, I just want to like call it out and with my art, you know, that I think sometimes, you know, people can call out something, but then people like, oh, that's bullshit. And who are you anyway? It's like, but if you have some art, then people look at you different, you know, like a vehicle to deliver it. It's not just some crazy guy that says something crazy because he actually is good at something. You know what I mean? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And, Maybe I, I want to use that to, to call out some, some stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just an idea, actually. I'd like yesterday or whatever, but that kind of got me motivated. You know? well, it's like you but say, it, a lot of the the way that the films are made, there's pretty standard. You talk about like action sports films, like Surf, Snow, Skate, or whatever. When you see a good one, when you see one with a point of view or with a different way of getting the message across, it's still mm-hmm. really rare, right? You yeah, know? yeah, totally. Totally. And I can't remember who I was just talking with somebody that had nothing to do with snowboarding. And the person was like, 
Yeah, and then I watched this uh, the the snowboard film, and it's sh- snowboarding, 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 and it all looks the same. And the person <laughs> is like, "How? Who tells you to do this trick?" I'm like, "Nobody tells you to do this trick." But why in the film? Probably they were thinking like every rider in the part at some point does a frontside three, <laughs> you know, like stale or whatever, you know. Yeah. So it's like, why do you do the same stuff? Well, it's all white and blue. Yeah, or like, <laughs> yeah, it's maybe the same trick. It's a frontside three stale fish, but it's the way you do it that's different, you know. Yeah, like well, everybody. And then they're like, huh, okay, well, uh. that's difficult and to then, communicate if you're not like, in that world, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. And then the person was like, but I thought really interesting. In the beginning, there was just a portrait and a smile and like, show more of that, you know? And I was like, okay, oh, well, like, yeah, I mean, the person basically meant like, it would be interesting to see the personality behind the, the front side tree. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I understand. Well, it's that balance, but isn't it, between the, like you say, the yeah. trick porn and the, the kind of location yeah. porn, which is such a big part of it. Yeah. And this like telling a story and mm-hmm. it is, it is definitely, yeah. Mm-hmm. fertile then, ground I yeah, think yeah but then you have the hardcore snowboard scene and if you have too much you're like oh there he's smiling again it's like they don't want to see that they just want to see your best tricks yeah, yeah. they just want to see but the tricks the whole bubble is so small and almost getting smaller right because yeah. the, the people is like ah oh, this oh, snowboarding next year movie premiere yeah everybody has a front of three stale again yeah, like, yeah I don't get it you know? yeah yeah <laughs> how was the response and, to fruition because it was kind of different did people did did yeah. people criticize it like that approach no actually not that much and but you know it's the classic when when you go somewhere and you show it nobody's going to tell you in your face it's shit you hey know, that was great like, hey, it's great <laughs> but you, you don't really know the truth you know yeah but yeah in, in general i thought i think people were were stoked on it yeah it's like i think they're like super hardcore Snowboarders, they were like, where are triple corks? Where yeah, the, yeah. They were expecting it to be like how like Art of Fly came out and it was like, oh my God. And then it was like, okay, Nicholas coming out of the film. He's been working for it for years. Yeah. And there wasn't even a double cork in it. You know, yeah, they yeah. were kind of disappointed. But I think, you know, in general, yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm stoked. So what ambitions do you have left with snowboarding? Because it's what, 20, 20 years now? Your career? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. So well, it's a good see, it's a good point to Yeah. You know. Well, I think we're doing the twenty twenty movie with thirty two team video coming up. But uh, ambitions yeah, I think there's certain tricks I would like to do, you know? In my age, just because like Yeah. Maybe yeah. Just to, to not, I mean it sounds lame to say to prove people wrong, but like yeah. Now I eat hemp, I drink chaga and all that <laughs> stuff, and uh, I'm gonna do, I don't know, triple cork or something. Yeah. If the jump is right, but I don't want to pressure myself too much, and I will never get bored of snowboarding. You know, maybe somebody tell me if it's time to stop. You know, because <laughs> then I don't want to hold a spot for a new up and coming because it's like, come on, it's time for for you to move on, but. I don't know, so far so good. And I want to be the guy that's still doing it, you know, and having fun, you know. And no, I'm not just giving up just because I'm pushing 40. As I I heard that before, I was like, what is that even? <laughs> what? Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, so Past 35, but. Who was it? My friend said to me the other day, like, are we middle-aged? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hate to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm yeah, a little bit older than you, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, I think like we were saying earlier, that, you know, forgetting what the industry kind of approaches, there are people still killing it. I mean, Terry, mm-hmm. we talked about Terry a couple of times. Yeah. I mean, Jesus, like, Terry is still, he's still doing it, isn't he? Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. he's probably my age maybe 43 yeah right? I think yeah 43, 44 yeah still going yeah no I'm I'm excited uh, I just want to keep being a, an ambassador for snowboarding <laughs> yeah well thanks for doing it man yeah yeah of course, it's been yeah. awesome thank you so there you go that was me and Nicholas and I hope you enjoyed it it was so great to see Nicholas hugely grateful for him for coming over to the UK 
to take part in the show and for generally being such a good sport. He's more amped for snowboarding than I've ever seen him, I reckon, and I can't wait to see what the new season brings for him. Big thanks to Olivia as well for the good times in London. And uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. So there you go. That was episode 100B and the second part of my episode 100 double header. There's no housekeeping corner this episode, which will resume with the rest of the normal service next week. Up next is the latest installment of my Patagonia Type 2 show, which you can listen to by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast platform. It's a good one, that one. Recommend you check it out. I'll be back next week. I promise I won't go on about episode 100 anymore. But in the meantime, a huge thanks to everyone who supported the show for the last two and a half years, well, nearly three years, actually. I'm proud of what I've created with the podcast, especially the fact that I've kept it free of charge and free of advertising in the meantime. That was always a goal when I started it, not to do any of those fucking god-awful adverts that bedevil this format. And uh, I've managed it. So uh, yeah, there we go. That said, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can still support the show by leaving me a review on Apple Podcasts, sharing the thing on social media, buying some merch over at my site, www.wearelookingsideways.com. Or as I said, very much in the early days in episode one you could just tell a mate about it the good old-fashioned way i always love getting feedback too so if you want to get in touch find me at podcast at we are looking sideways.com or dm me on instagram over at we look sideways be warned though i'll probably share it if you do you can also head over to my website where you'll find the huge back catalog and the full show notes to every episode completely free of charge so there you go that's it i'll be back next time thanks for listening nice one <laughs>